morning, everybody. This is Melissa with Overcomer Ministries. I am here with Casey Blair, and we are on our working on our second episode of Unpacked with Overcomer Ministries. Um, this is just something that God laid on my heart. I believe that um, we all have a story that will benefit or encourage or help others. Um, this ministry is totally just to give back to God, um, to help others, to encourage others, to provide information if you have questions or if you know someone that needs help. So um, thanks for joining and we're going to get started. Casey, yes, nice to meet you <laughs> again. Uh, yes. Um, so I would like to start from when you were a child. Um, I've heard a lot of times that addictions kind of start from a traumatic childhood. Not saying that you had one, but I would just like to hear your story starting from a child. Like what's the youngest, what do you think is the youngest age that you can remember as a child? I remember most, of my, I can remember some of my childhood from California where, I mean. Is that where you were born? Yeah, I was born in Carmel, California, and uh, I was raised there the first eight years of my life. And my life there was, my dad worked hard. He had his own construction company. Mom stayed home, took care of his kids. It was different out there, though, because I was put in a Catholic school because um, I was raised in Salinas, and there were gangs everywhere in Salinas. And Dad put me in the Catholic school for my safety. That's how it was out there. It's totally different. And uh, I remember being pampered, family trips, always family-oriented. And... Uh, I was raised well out there. I mean, my fa my dad did what he had to do. He, like I said, he had, everything was family oriented. I remember they always went to lakes. They drank, you know what I'm saying. But it was always my godparents and everybody was always there, and his his construction crew. Everything was knit together, and it wasn't until we come out to California, my parents got divorced, and. Uh, it's when we moved to Missouri. I can't tell you what happened. Everything when, just, when they got divorced? Yeah, it was about, I was 13 when they got divorced, and I didn't understand what happened. And that's probably where my anger started, and uh, everything started with me. I can't tell you what happened. When I come here from Missouri, um, everything now, shifted. did you have any siblings? I have, a, I have a little brother, J.D. Blair, and I have an older sister who's taking care of my dad right now in Michigan. He has dementia. Okay. Um, we were all, when we moved to California, my dad built a motel here in Mountain Grove, Missouri in the 80s. And, uh, what, what was it? It was called the Mountain Grove Motel. Huh. Yeah. I used to run around Mountain Grove a little yeah. bit. I remember It's the that. one right off of 60, the oldest motel there. He built it. He come here and he borrowed half the money from the bank and he had the other half. I mm -hmm. can't tell you what happened. I just know my parents one day just, my mom was gone. Dad. They got divorced. I went with my mother. My sister stayed with my father. Um, that's when I started drinking. And uh, my mom had it rough. And uh, that's when I started stealing. So I when would, your parents divorced, yes, I, you went with? Yeah, dad kept dying. My older sister, who's my uh, older sibling by five years, and I went with my mother. And I, where, we stayed in Mountain Grove? Yeah, we stayed in Mountain Grove. And uh, dying Even stayed. Dad? Yeah, yeah, everybody stayed in Mountain Grove. Mom had a nervous breakdown. And... Uh, I ain't told him, I remember this now. <laughs> I pray my dad could see this because I had a key to the motel. Mom wasn't making it, so I would literally go over there and take money out of the register. Didn't give it, come back and give it to mom. And that's where my, everything started. And that's also when I realized what my father was doing because one of my sister's friends, when I had uh, went in the motel, we were looking for money and uh, he found the pouch of my dad's cocaine. And he told me, he said, let's take this. He knew what it was, I didn't. I said, no, leave that. I'm here for money for my mom. And that's probably when things started. I was drinking all the time. So up to that point, though, you had never, you had no idea what I had never knew what it was. was, no. And uh, mom had a nervous breakdown, and she's passed away now. She died a year ago, a little over a year ago. And uh, My mom left me on the doorstep of the motel. And that my dad had come home and that's where my mother was at. And she'd have literally had a nervous breakdown and when my dad come home with his which was now my stepmom, the woman that raised me from thirteen on, um, Tina Blair, she's passed away too. 
But uh, Dad literally asked me, where's your mother? And I couldn't tell him. I was just there. I said, I don't know. And that's when things got real confusing for me. Dad had his girlfriend. So at um, 13, you were left at? Yeah, I left on my father's doorstep. So the what, what was going through your through your head at that point? Like, I don't know. I really couldn't tell you. I, I, I don't remember. That's, like I said, that's when I really started. Now that you brought that up, that's probably when I really started everything. Because that's when I started lashing out. Every bit of me started lashing out. Why would my mother abandon me? You know what I'm saying? Why, and why didn't my father want me here? Yeah. Is how I felt. Which, Dad was busy with his life. I understand that. Sis was busy. She was a teenager. You know what I'm saying? We had lost the motel. And then we had bounced around. And... Uh, I felt pushed back because Dad, had, I didn't know this woman. You know what I'm saying? I didn't like yeah. her. She took my, at that state of mind, I, I know what I was thinking. I didn't like her. She took my mother's place. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know her, didn't know who she was. Um, but later, all long in life, that, that woman became my best friend. She was the one I could always talk to because she had been through it a lot. And she would always sit down no matter what I'd go through. Anytime I'd come home from prison or, or, or I'd have to need, she would literally sit me down and, and she would talk talk to me. You know what I'm saying? Um, it was at 15 years old. We had bounced several homes. And uh, we had finally, um, Dad had gotten a place. And at 15 years old, he sat me down. He said, it's time, you know, he sat me and my sister down. And he said, it's time you know what I do. He said, no, nah, because you're going to get asked questions. He said, I need you, I need you to know this because you need to tell them what I tell you to tell them. And at 15 years old, he sat me down at a table and he said, this is what I do for a living. He said, I deal cocaine for a living. He said, if anybody asks you, I work over the road, I do construction. And by then I was trying to fit in and I was in FFA, all that. Did and that I, just whew, Yeah, yeah. I literally, I literally, this is what I told my father. I'll never forget it. I said, you appall me, you sicken me. I said, I'll never be like you. He said, son, this is what I'm telling you. He said, uh, this is what I do for a living. He said, I have to know that if the school asks you questions, you come and tell me right now. But I didn't know at the time my dad had moved to a large scale of distribution. He was never home. They were always gone. Um, we were, I mean, listen, he did what he did to take care of his family at the time. I know that now. I hold no ill will towards him for the things. I've forgiven my father because even he was lost as much as I was lost. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, I went to Catholic schools, as I said. I didn't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I never, for 47 years, I called myself a heathen for life. Um, I lived by old God, old ways, little G's, as we call them in the Bible. He, he created everything. There are no other gods but the one true king. I'll say that now with his boldness and faith because I realize that in my life. But at that state, I literally told my dad at 15, you sick of me, I'll never be like you. I had $30,000 for the registered Semitol cattle that he bought me. I didn't want to take care of him. I didn't know nothing about cattle. He put me in FFA. My stepmom was raised country. She knew all about it. She, and it, it, it was it was the thing that he was... I look back now, it was the way he could blunder his money. He had to. I didn't know what scale he was on, but he was on such a large scale that they were, they were traveling back and forth. And uh, it wasn't shortly after that. I'll never forget it. I was walking downstairs. Dad was asleep because they had a lot of people come by you know I'll never forget when I walked downstairs I happened to see his dish out that he kept his cocaine in, and I literally looked over and the thought that went my, through my head was well he does it let's try it and what I didn't know but I know now and I didn't know at that point in time but he told me later was that the moment I did that I was doing pure cocaine off a kilo I was interested but I and, and that what I told my father I would never do, I ended up doing. Um, I got caught stealing twenty-four thousand dollars from a cocaine of cocaine from him within two months. I had dropped to the smallest I'd ever been. He knew something was up, but he couldn't catch me. Um, my aunt had told on me for uh, not giving her none. She saved my life. I would have been dead. Even my dad said that you were gonna, you would, you you would have died. He said, I don't know how you're still alive. And the question I told him, or the answer I gave him, was, I'm just like you, Dad. And so at that point, let me let me cut in here real quick. I just want to say that you know, even myself as parents, we don't realize how much our kids are watching us. 
in, in what they see us do and what we do, you know, makes them think it's okay. Um, gosh, I'm, I'm not perfect either. But it is, you, kids are taking it all in whether we realize it or not, and they, they're so impressionable, and it is so important to take that seriously while they're little and while you can. I even know I look back now, and my boys are grown, but I see so many times and I thought, man, I wished I would have done that different, or I wished I would have said this or that or not done that in front of them. So it is important how you are with your kids and the things that you do in front of them. The words that you say, everything, they're impressionable. At 15, my dad, it was curiosity. I, I, and I, what you say, I agree with 100% because I remember doing it. Every parent should know this, man. If you're hiding in your bedrooms for a while or you're having parties end on end for days, the kids are going to wonder what's going on. Even though we don't, we're innocent at that age, we're going to start wondering what our parents are doing. It's going to come a time. The enemy used that one thought. My dad does it, so I can do it. Then I got raised into a lifestyle, man. When my dad caught me, I was expelled from Galena High because we had moved away. Um, he knew, he knew Galena. the feds, uh, Missouri. He knew the feds were on him. Um, we had many talks, but I was raised into that. I was into that lifestyle. I was my father's child. You know, say my fleshly father's child. We didn't. I didn't know church. Had nothing about. It. You know, I wasn't raised. I was raised in a total polar opposite of what normal kids are raised in. I was when I got expelled from school at 15 in Galena, my freshman year. I was never allowed to go back because it was after that dad caught me stealing the $24,000 of cocaine. Probably one of the scariest moments of my life. My dad was a very big man. Your dad finding. Yeah. You might, yeah. Finding yeah. 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 Um, there were multiple times. You know, there were high speed chases. Not really. He, he had fast cars, you know what I'm saying? And he didn't care. Um, there were certain aspects of his life I'm not going to talk about on camera. I know why he did what he did now. I know he, it was a get out of jail free card. When you're being indicted by the feds, you have a, you have a no fly zone. You go, they don't, nobody messes with you because they're indicting you. When the feds, I was 15, I started working concrete. When I got caught, dad said, you're not going back to school. It's a waste. It's a waste. Plain so and simple. how long, like how much school have you actually had? I got my, I, I went to my freshman year and after that I was, I started working concrete at 15 years old. Um, Dad said, you're going to pay me back the money you owe me. He said, you owe me $24,000. He said, you're going to pay it back. I'll never forget the first time I walked in with formal from head to toe working concrete at 15 years old and I probably put in 60 hours that week. I walked in with a check. He said, I can cash that for you, son. <laughs> Gave him it, he counted out my money. <laughs> I was making $4 an hour at 15. That was in the early, eight, late 80s, mm -hmm. early 90s. Those were days. And uh, I worked hard. And uh, he literally took half my money. He said, this is for me, this is for you. He said, every week you'll pay me what you owe me. Hey, but he was teaching me something. I, I was being held accountable for my actions. You know what I'm saying? And also, I was being taught a work ethic from a, a man who passed away recently, David Homer. He taught me the work ethic I have. Man, he worked hard, we worked hard. Um, but my dad sat me down after that first check and he told me, he said, you're a grown man now. He said, you'll do my drugs, you'll sell my drugs. That way I know what you're doing. It's not going to kill you because there's poison out there. And he said, I know if you're selling drugs for me, you're not my competition. Well, so he was worried about you being his competition? At that aspect, you got to remember this. My dad was in a full-blown drug addiction himself. He, he was not the man I know today. He was not the man I knew grow up. As the enemy was working in me, he was also working in my father. Um, my father, I love him to this day. He did what he did for his family to support him. I know that now. He, he took wrong paths the enemy got in his head. Um, am I defending his actions? No, man. We all do stupid stuff in our lost ways. None of us are perfect. Um, my dad paid for his, his crimes. He did five years in the federal institutions. Um, my stepmom did five years in the federal institutions. Um, God rest her soul. She's in a heaven now. My dad, he suffers with dementia. But uh, when he was in the feds, what happened was they got him. And when they got him, my life immediately went crazy in Mountain Road, Missouri, because I was Alan Blair's son. Everybody started coming after me. So that's where I started to learn to fight.
my dad told me, he said, if you're my son, you're going to be my son. You have a worldly status quo to live by. And I had to live by that status quo. Uh, my first fight was, uh, you whoop him or I do. And if you lose, I whoop you. My dad was a big man, as I said. He was very scary. And uh, I understand the things he did to a point. He was in a lost state. And as I grew up in that lost state, I, I'm, I'm so thankful my sons, this is sad to say they didn't grow up around me. They were given a chance with their grandmother. They were raised in the Abernathy of the church. They didn't grow up like in the life I would have grown up in. Because if they'd have been around me, they would have been in that life, whether they knew it or not, you know what I'm saying? Because like my father, I ended up in that life. That wasn't his decision for me. It's just how, he, that's what he knew at the time. Um, when he got sentenced to five years in the feds, they also started hammering down on me then. I was Al Blair's kid. I was no good, this, that, the other. I was labeled by society, so I became what society labeled me. I became exactly what the label put. I was a drug dealer, absolutely. I'll get as many as I could. I was fighting all the time, absolutely. I'll try to be the very best at it. Everything they said in court that I was, I became. Um, my dad did five in the feds, and I did my first state bit. And, uh, I remember him writing me letters and something had changed. He was writing me scriptures through those letters. He was telling me something had from happened prison? in prison? Yes, from federal prison. He was telling me something had happened in his life that he had met that he had found God. I I didn't understand it. I knew my first wife's mother at the time, because I was later I was in my twenties by then, was an ordained minister, a preacher. And I had married I had said the words but I didn't mean them. It was the, the piece hurt. But I knew what he was talking about because I had seen it then. I, I wanted no part of it. It wasn't for me. Um, as I said, I was raised in, and I, once I got raised and the enemy got his full Italians into me, that's what I became. I became anger, rage, malice. I became everything society said I was. So once, once you got this letter from him and he was different, did that, did a part of you want to be like, what are you going to be different now after you, after I'm, been influenced this way and now you're gonna absolutely it caused a wedge between us i didn't understand him um he tried when he made parole but when they finally let him out of the feds they do it different he started his construction company again. he built from the ground up a successful business again and he did it with the sweat of his brow in his late 40s and 50s you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and uh i was bouncing in and out of prison let's see i've spent 15 years in prison I had, a, I had, praise God, I don't know more, a 33-year addiction I could never beat. I tried every aspect of it. I led, I led death and destruction for a long time. But let's back step to when my dad went. When he was writing me these letters, I was a full-blown drug addict. I started using drugs intravenously. Um, he did his time and got out probably mid-90s, and I was doing my second prison bit by then. I'll never forget when I first met him, he was totally different. Um, I say that because he was the man that I remember as a kid, but not the man I was even accepting in the life that I had now. He tried to the point of exhaustion to me, where I'd be like, listen, just give it up. Talking this is, to this you about is this. God. He would talk to me about God. He would work with next to me. He, he still had his stuff to work through, but he, everybody does. But he would talk to me about him. And I'd like, listen, finally I had to tell him, I'm like, listen, here's where I'm at with it. This is your life. This is my life. This is what I'm into. You do your thing. I'm going to do mine. Leave me alone. I'm a heathen for life. It's done, Dad. And uh, he, he continued to pray for me. My aunts prayed for me. My family's prayed for me. Um, but it was a life I, I walked. I chose to walk it because I knew no other life, even though my dad was trying to be God's vessel to offer it to me. I've been through three failed marriages. all due to my own drug abuse introducing everyone I'm into it into that lifestyle of if I was out of prison I could stay sober in prison I never understood why why I could stay sober in there but the moment I stepped out the gates it was right back to addiction instantly I could work for a little while you know what I'm saying but then sooner or later I'd always get true right back full into the addiction everybody around me was cooking drugs I was labeled so much Every time I get pulled over, I was harassed, and uh, I just, in my mind, I was never going to be able to give it a chance. So why try? 
I, I'm covered in tattoos. Um, so, what? You got tattoos? Yeah. I've been looking for a little guy. He's about this tall. He's kind of quick. Every time I turn around and go to sleep, he draws on me. I, I say that to the kids all the time before I see him. And uh, I'm like, he's got a Sharpie in his hand. If you all see me, look. and I do that encounter. It's to break the ice with people because yeah. when I walk up to people now, they look at me. People that know me now, and I tell my story of who I am now, they're like, you couldn't have been that guy. I'm like, I was that guy much worse. I spent my whole life fighting the system. Um, in Ezekiel, he tells us about having a heart of stone, that he took the heart of stone and gave us a heart of flesh. My heart was so calloused over in stone that where I come from, man, it's all changed now. The churches are open. They're more, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and there's been a movement in my little town and the surrounding towns around it. I didn't have that growing up. And I used to always say this, man, if there was something different, I would do it. I wasn't looking in the right spots. My whole life, I was, I was, I was running with the, with the crowd that was doing everything wrong. So how am I going to see anything right if I'm doing everything wrong? It's choices. I had a choice to make. I kept making the wrong ones my whole life, man. But I had a heart of stone. I didn't want to. In the life I lived, man, I had no room for God. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I had no room for him. I had no room for kindness, mercy, grace. I became, I became my environment. Um, I look back now, man, and, and I know I see what God pulled me from when I said I never believed in Him. Uh, like I said, I spent 33 years in addiction. From the time I was 13 years old, I was drinking. Um, I've been in multiple bits of trouble. I've done eight prison bits, 15 years. Um, like I said, I've only. Um, I never thought I could use God. I, I can relate to uh, Saul. I, I persecuted the church. I persecuted the Christians in prison. And, and, and God blinded me, and I'll never forget it. I was looking to, I had made God promises. I had been in a bar fight, and I did five years for it. I, got, I stabbed a man five times. And uh, I'll never forget it. Something changed in me shortly after that. I never, when I went back to prison, I had letters coming statewide. What happened, brother? Why are you, why, you know, what happened? You should be out with your kids. I'm like let it go, just let it go, and I and it, something had clicked, man. And I had made a promise to myself that I would never hurt a man like that again. What I did to him, I, everybody's like, "Well, you were drunk." Everybody was making excuses for me. They're like, "Casey, you were drunk." I said, "No, I remember every every bit of it like it was yesterday." Um, and uh, I made myself a promise. And that's when things started to change inside. I didn't know what was happening. It was, it was took a time. It took time. To... I had stabbed that man, and uh, I had made myself a promise of I'd never hurt somebody again like that. And I went back to prison, was doing five years, and something started to change, man. I literally was talking to certain brothers of mine, and I wasn't in it no more. I could feel it. I could feel my heart changing, man. And after what I did to that guy, man, that, that takes a toll on you. You have a... It's, I got no remorse tattooed across my back. I have remorse now. Um, I started to get remorse. I was never a remorseful person. And it was after that moment, man, things started to change me. I don't know if God started calling me then or started to soften in my heart. As I said, man, I, I was, I was, I had nothing for God. And uh, I got an out. Like I said, I called myself a heathen for life and I, I tried to do things different. And, uh, I got out in 2015, and I was actually out. I got remarried, and uh, her biggest deal was when we got married. I, I'll say the vows. I got no problem with it, so I don't follow them anyways. That's what she said. Yeah, she said my biggest problem is you're not a Christian. She said if you say these vows, how are you standing on them? So I can say anything to God right now. I got to stand on it. And she just looked at me. Well, uh, it was uh, that, that marriage ended. It's over. Um, man, I put her in a lifestyle she should never been brought into. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I, I, in, my, in my old life, I destroyed countless lives. Um, it was in a 2018. I was away from my family, things had happened. I was living in Mountain Grove, Missouri. She was living in Springfield. So I started running drugs again. And uh, God knew my heart says he knows our heart. He knew if I went back to Springfield, there were going to be deaths. He knew my heart, and I had death on my heart when I was going back. I had the Mustang loaded. Uh, 
my PO had been trying to get me to come in. I told her I was living in Springfield. I literally t was going to see her, and I, God will put you in a timeout to get your attention. And uh, I'll never forget the timeout he put me in. I was literally with a friend of mine. We were coming back from Marshfield, picking up his son and his uh, ex-wife, and we got pulled over. He looked over at me and he said, Casey, what do I do? I said, you better keep driving. He said, where do I stop? I said, stop on this hill, I can build that fence. And uh, it was so crazy, I couldn't get out the door. <laughs> it was nuts, I could not get out the door. I was literally, when he parked, when he stopped, it looked like an easy spot, but when he stopped and I looked over, it was up in the bank. And I was like, I looked over, I was like, here we go. And uh, the cops come up and they said, Dave, and immediately they looked in, they said, Casey, go ahead and get out of the car right now. I said, I know. They said, what's going on, man? They said, you got a warrant, PMP. I said, P and P? I said, no, man. They said, no, one's just been issued. It just come What's across. P &P? It's a probation and parole hold. My, oh, okay. my PO had gave me every chance she could to come in, and uh, I didn't. So God knew my heart. He knew if I got back to Springfield, what was going to happen. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into it, but he knew what I was going to do. Um, there were certain parts of why I was gone, and I was going to hurt people up there. And uh, to prove my point of who I was. You don't cross me, they cross me in certain ways they shouldn't have. And uh, literally, I go to jail. And uh, I tell my people, I'm like, man, get me out. They're like, okay. I'm like, well, well as soon as they said PMP, I said, don't bother. <laughs> I said, make sure that car gets back to where it goes and everything of mine goes back where it's at. And uh, my wife had found out I was in jail. And uh, I called. And uh, I don't know what happened in that jail cell. Man, I went nuts. Uh, literally, I was fixing to eat a TV dinner when I looked at this dude. I said, I know who you are. I said, man, I'll whoop you for your, for your cousin. He said, whenever you're ready, big boy, and I was fixing to take a bite of my chicken patty when I heard all the brothers in there that knew me from prison say no, and it was too late. I hit the man three times, broke his nose, ribs, and jaw, and they finally got me to stop and I walked away. And I literally felt something change. I broke my promise. Not only to myself, I did it once in prison. I'd caught an assault in prison and almost caught a new case. And then I did it again. And that man went to court the next day and literally walked through 22 people and looked like a Cherokee Indian with war paint. But it was blood. He didn't wash up the night before. Nobody cleaned him up and got to court. And when I looked up, I literally looked, I said, did nobody bother to make sure he was cleaned up? That was God's way. I see it now. Um, he walked up to court and they asked him what happened. And they literally told him, Casey Blair did this to me, please don't put me back down. And he said, that man's got a demon. He told the courts, that man's got a demon in him. I'm scared of him. Um, well, they come downstairs, cuff me, and put me in the drunk tank. And if you've ever been in Wright County, it's a solid steel box with a hole in the floor. I literally lost my mind in that cage. I, I don't know what was happening. Um, I was, my wife literally come down and I had the guys calling on the phone. We had a little hole in the floor that was chipped out through concrete and I could talk to him through that. I said, call her now. And Ray Ray kept calling. He's like, bro, she, she said it took everything I had, every skill, every, every bit of my mouthpiece to get her to stay, in your, stay with you. She said, dude, she was leaving you. I said, man, Ray Ray, and a young man literally gets one of them little pocket Bibles and gets it shoved through there. He said, you're gonna need this where you're at right now. And uh, I said, thank you. And I start, I just put it aside. And uh, my wife finally got down there and got him my meds and said, he should never be in here. If these are his meds, he's been without them. Um, I was on, I can't remember the names on them, but they had diagnosed me with PTHD bipolar, schizophrenia, I was homicidal, suicidal, and uh, I was never supposed to go without my meds because of my mental state, they said, but it was all due to self-inflicted of drugs. Um, the jailer literally walked back after seven days and being that drunk tank, put me up front. I said, I won't go up front, I've never been up front. He said, well, this is where you're going if you want out. The girls next door literally somehow got me blankets through the chuck hole. They had, and, and so I could make a hammock because in there they didn't have no mattresses or pillows. We were sleeping on cold steel. And uh, the next day the jailer, the guys in the back, Lily found out they had let me out and Lily said, let him back here. And uh, 
he walked up. He said, you took, you've been taking your meds? I said, yeah. He said, come on, you're going to the back. And uh, it was Wednesday night. My brother, Dodie Butcher, who uh, he saved by grace, changed his life forever. And I've known that man since 15. We run. And he was an old country boy, but we always got along. And uh, I'll never forget it. Um, I walked in that jail cell. They were all like, Casey. I just looked at him. I said, what happened? <laughs> I said, what happened, guys? I said, somebody let him out. And they said, he's not here no more. I'm like, well, I figure not. <laughs> I said, so, well, they said, what are they looking, what are, what are they doing? They took me upstairs. I was looking at 22 years for a jailhouse fight. They were tired of me. And uh, Dodie Butcher walked in. And I was packed, putting my stuff in my cell. He said, Casey Blair. He said, I got a word from God from you, my brother. I said, you can take your, I said, Dodie, you can take your big Christy blinkity blink blink right back out that door. I'm a heathen for life. I'm not trying to hear it. I got no room for God. My brother being the loyal servant he is. He said, Casey, God told me to tell you this. He said, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. That's the message he told me to tell you. What I didn't know now in November of 2018 was Dodie Butcher as the vessel for God plants the biggest seed in my life that would flourish in an amount of time that was amazing. I didn't know what happened. Dodie gave his message, gave me a hug and walked out. He said, is there anything I can do for you? He said, you know what to do, call him. He said, I got you. He said, I love you, my brother, and walked out. Even though I said them words to him, he never faltered. Um, that week, something in me changed. I cannot tell you what happened. I wear pumas for a reason, and I always use this. I said I was like a caged puma in that jail cell. I could not sit still. I could not think straight. My mind was scrambled. The guys that knew me would barely talk to me. They were quiet. They knew they were, I was, I was uh, volatile, best I could say. Anything would set me off. And uh, that week kept getting it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm like, man, I've been to jail. I've been to prison. This, I don't know what's going on with me. And they kept talking, man, we cannot wait till Doty comes in Wednesday. And it was that Wednesday, and they were talking about Doty coming in, and I looked at him, I said, I don't know why you guys are so worried about Doty. He's just going to come preaching that word again. I ain't trying to hear it. And there was something right here. It just felt like a knot. And uh, my brother Brooks Williams is in there. He's just smiling. And uh, Ray Ray, my brother Ray, he's in Ray Ray, Timothy Jean, he's in C. He tell me, Casey, your daddy has got something for you. And i uh, never forget that Wednesday night, man. Literally, I, everybody was quiet. I was on eggshells. They were on eggshells with me, man. And Doty, I'll never forget, I heard the keys of the steel door open. And I could hear Doty's voice. And by the time they got the steel door open, I was there bawling like a baby. And Doty was bent over, picking up his Bibles, and I was standing over him, and the jailer was looking at me, and I was just crying. Dodie kind of looked up. He said, hey, my brother. He said, I forgot something. He looked up. I said, I need to talk to you in back right now. And Dodie looked at me. He said, what's going on? When he looked up, he looked at me. He said, oh, it's time. I said, what's time? He said, he's a calling. I said, who's a calling? He said, God's calling, Casey. I said, Dodie, we need to talk in the back. I don't know what's happening to me right now. I said, something's happening. I said, this, I don't know. He said, he said Casey, God's calling you right now to his embrace. He said, we can wait. He said, I can wait to go to the truck. He said, he, he grabbed his stuff and walked in. Dodie, I took him to the back cell. I said, Dodie, what's happening to me? He said, Casey, he said, what did I tell you last week? Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. I said, Dodie, I bow to no man. He said, you're not bowing to a man, Casey. He said, God's calling you into his love and embrace, and he explained some things to me. I said, Dodie, I got something right here. And uh, I couldn't stop crying. And Dodie called all the guys back, all the guys that knew me. And, uh, they prayed over me, and Dodie said, Casey, I'm going to ask you a few things. And he asked me, he, he led me down the Romans road of salvation, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'd never cried so hard in my life. And, uh, man, he gave me a life's recovery Bible. He told me to start reading. And I started reading in Matthew. And for the next two months, I read solid. Card games were done. Um, there was a peace about me that I'd never felt in my life. I wasn't worried about nothing no more. I wasn't worried about going back to prison. And uh, Dodie would come in every Wednesday, talk to me, give me messages. When he talked to my wife, she started coming down to visit. And she told me, she said, uh, 
just get through it. You know, I had gotten immersed in my word to the point of I was not involved in nothing. There were no more fights in the jail. We were letting the PCs out. And I can't explain what happened in that time, but it's rough. They have a new one now, but it was rough. Like I said, we were sleeping on cold steel and concrete. We had hammocks made up everywhere, you know what I'm saying, to sleep on them just so we wouldn't have to. But it was probably the most peaceful time of my entire life because I do I would do nothing from the time I woke up till the time I went to bed. Let's read my word. I started in Matthew and I stopped at Revelation. I start over again and just read it. And uh, did you find yourself looking forward to it? That's all I do. That's all I had time for. I, I mean, I, I, like I said, I didn't want part of their card games. I didn't want part of nothing. If it wasn't. And, and Brooke, we'd have Bible studies in there. People would help me when I had questions that were that knew the Bible from their time of studying it. And uh, I'll never forget. My wife told me she said, "You better, you better hope and pray. God's on your side." She said, "I've talked to the prosecutor, and he says he's got you dead to rights, Casey." He said, "So you better make sure everybody in that jail was unlocked." And there was one that wasn't. And uh, I got to meet that man a while back when I got to go into jail, and I and I shook his hand. I told him thank you. He saved my life. God did in that jail cell. I didn't get it right. Um, the court saw something different when I went up. I don't know what it was. All I can say is God put his robe of righteousness on me when I went to court. I didn't get 22 years. I got a 10 year backup with a 120. And uh, I took it. So when I went to that 120, I did nothing but study my Bible. I did my classes, study my Bible. But I wasn't prepared for what was in store for me when I got out. I, I knew something had changed, and I knew the word. But and I'm a firm believer in these discipleship houses now because they they help you get through. Like I was a lifetime addict, a lifetime of brokenness, a lifetime of it. Forty-seven years of brokenness. I never knew God. I didn't know how to change. I knew the word, but I didn't know how to apply it to my life. Or they teach you these things, and uh, I had uh, gotten out and uh, went right back to my addiction. Somebody handed me something right when I got out of prison. I got off the, I got off the bus, the Greyhound bus, and within 30 minutes it was in my hand. I didn't know what to do. Instead of praying, I just did it. And that caused a six-month spiral of, man, it was horrible. And on December 19th, I walked out of my family, and I'll be truthful. I was going to get everybody involved was going to die or I was going to die. I knew it. I was going to either kill myself or kill the people involved in it. And, uh. I just knew that, and uh, I kept staying for the, for her son. But there was a time when I had to leave. I just had to leave because the damage I was doing was worse than, you know, what I'm saying the things mm -hmm. he was seeing was not what he needed to see. Mm -hmm. um, so I walked out on Christmas Day, December 2019. I spent 10 days in a psych ward in Springfield, not knowing how I got there. Um, I know some things happened. There's 30 days in Springfield. I don't remember. To it, I don't remember. I mean, I know there's spots when I come up here. Um, I can cross through and it just is like a blur up. I know I've been here, but you know, I was in a drug induced haze of just trying to forget. I don't know if I had a mental breakdown. I don't know if the enemy was trying to kill me, which it says he tries to kill, steal, and destroy, so I'm sure he was. Yeah. But I also knew God was calling me. I did the 10 days in the psych ward, got out, and uh, it was a friend of mine's dad that took me to Mountain Road, Missouri, and dropped me off at a friend's house. I had nothing. I had lost absolutely everything in that 30 days. Everything I owned was gone. I had the clothes that I was wearing. I sat there with that friend of mine, and I had a duffel bag I'd left there. And uh, he said, this is your clothes. And I looked down, I didn't lose everything. I got something. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget, we were doing things we shouldn't have been doing, man. And uh, something came over me. I just looked at him, and it was, it was snowing outside. And uh, it was December. I looked at him. I just took off walking. I said, bye, I'm gone. He said, what? And I literally walked to town five miles. Walked to another friend's house, did something I should have never did there that I swore I'd never do. I put a needle in my arm that night. Literally, I had coveralls then. He gave me some clothes, a backpack full of clothes. I had some coveralls on, some logging boots, Carhartt coat and hoodie, a backpack full of clothes. And something told me to leave. I got up in 14, it was 14 degrees, it was snowing and sleeting outside, and I took off walking down the highway. Um, some things happened to me that night. I know God saved my life that night. And uh, it was three days later, I, I fell asleep. I, I, something popped in my ribs and I was walking down the railroad tracks. I don't know what it was, I couldn't catch my breath. 
And I'll never forget when my face hit the cold steel of them railroad tracks. I begged God, if you save me, I will serve. He did. I, I don't know how long I was down, but uh, I felt something like a, like something hit me on my chest and my breath come back. I can't explain what happened. I don't know what the pop was on my chest, but I'll never forget that night. I walked in freezing cold. People say hell is hot. I believe it's freezing cold. I believe I went through things that night that no man, that the only thing that got me through it was God. Because I had something keep pushing me forward and I got to a place of safety. And uh, the next, I slept in an abandoned car at a friend's house and I've never been able to tell him thank you to this day. Because who puts a blanket in an abandoned car? He did, he had a box full of stuff in there. I literally slept in his field in an abandoned car, wrapped up in a blanket, and only God kept me warm that night. I literally woke up after a couple hours sleep. I couldn't feel my feet. I got out of the car, stomped my feet, walked to the road. And on these frozen roads, I didn't even hear it coming, was a man pulled, pulled up, rolled down his window and said, son, can I give you a ride? He said, what are you doing out in weather like this? Yeah, you give me a ride. He gave me a ride to a friend's house, or to a friend's business. He couldn't believe what happened. And uh, he'd offered me something. I said, no, I'm done. And uh, then he called a sister of Christ of mine. She come and got me. I went through a mental breakdown of, I don't, I couldn't explain it that night. And uh, I ended up somehow the next day on the Mountain Movement's door, Mountain Movement Ministries door where Dodie Butcher was. He told me, if you ever need me, I will be here, my brother. And uh, I had walked the past at the night, a couple of nights before in that freezing cold and walked, I was ashamed, I was guilty, I felt guilt. Everything the enemy was throwing on me, I just kept walking. And uh, I can't explain what happened that night or through that time, but I know God was with me every step of the way. And uh, when I walked on the ministry doors, the whole house was sick. We, we think it was the first case of COVID around that area. They were drop mm -hmm. dead sick. Yeah. I knocked on the door and nobody answered. And I remember walking up the road in freezing cold with nothing. I, and I'd lost everything again in that little amount of time. All I had was a thin summertime like hoodie and some pants and I was freezing cold. And I remember walking up the road, tears coming down my face thinking, have I gotten that far from God that he's, he's left me? That, that a ministry house won't even open their doors. And I'm standing a quarter mile up the road at a stop sign crying right off the road in some pine trees and a cop goes by and I get mad. And uh, I'm like, man, I'm gonna freeze to death out here. I got nowhere to go. Everybody's left me. That's what the enemy was putting through my mind. Mm. Everybody had abandoned me. I stormed back, to, I, I walked back to that ministry house and I thought in my mind, I'm, gonna, I'm going in, it's warm in there. It's a ministry house. Surely they won't turn me away. Surely I can come up with, the, you know, this is a good enough reason why I come in. Knocked on the door and my brother, Brian Orell, opened the door. He said, how can I help you? I was freezing to death and I was crying. I said, is Dodie here? I said, man, he told me to come here if I ever needed him. Dodie heard my voice and he was death. Now, Dodie's a big man. He, and, he, he, and to see Dodie stagger like that, and he was just kind of, he said, brother, I'm deathly sick. And uh, he was standing up on their little stoop. <laughs> I said, brother, I said, uh, I died last night. He said, I know you're born again. I said, no, Dodie. He said, I died last night in the railroad track. Something happened to me. I said, by the grace of God, I'm here. He said, Dodie, I lost everything. And he looked at me and I was just crying. He said, somebody make him a pot of coffee, man. Welcome my brother into this house. He said, let me get dressed. He said, what happened, Casey? I said, everything's gone. I've lost everything, Dodie. My family, everything. I have no clothes, no nothing. I said, I'm telling you right now, I died. I froze to death last night, Dodie. I know God, but I know it. And Dodie, come down. Brian Rowe got me a hot cup of coffee, gave it to me, started asking me questions. And uh, I had no drugs on me, nothing. And uh, the Mountain Movement Ministry called John McClure and they offered hospitality as Christian as the house does. They gave me a place to stay because I had nowhere to go. And that's when everything started going um, different for me. I had went back in that old life and it says, when you keep your house clean and, un and, it's, and, it, and it comes back and it's unkept, it'll bring back seven more vicious and stronger. I honestly believe when I back, went back to my old life, I welcomed more stuff back on. When it brought, it, it, they, they, they were, I was willingly allowing them because every time you do a drug, I believe, man, if you're born again, you're allowing, you're allowing that devil or demon right back into you. I'm a firm believer in that. You may not think you're willing and allowing it to come in, but I believe you're allowing it into your presence again. I believe that. Because if you think about the methamphetamine epidemic, man, it's, it's sorcery in its finest way. It's chemicals being, it's alchemy. That's the 
form, oldest form of witchcraft there is. That's and what's witchcraft? It's of the enemy. I'm firm believe that anybody's doing it, you're a victim of it. You don't know it. I, I believe that in my heart and my soul now, because man, for two weeks I was sober. They drug tested me. They were allowing me to stay at that house, but. Jonathan was reaching out in every resource he had across the state of Missouri. And if you know John McClure, he's got a lot of resources. Everyone told me the same thing. No, he's a violent offender. No, he's too violent. No, his medication, we won't allow him here. He tried everything to the point I was ready to give up. And every time, Jonathan kept telling me, fill out this application, Casey. And every time I get to the testimony, how I get there, I'd scramble. My mind, I couldn't think. I could, I'd get angry. I'd, get, I'd, just, I'd go sideways. It's the best I'd explain it. And uh, Dodie'd come pray for me, or, or the guys in the house would pray for me. You know, I could not fill out that testimony part of how I got there. I still don't, to this day, know how I got there from Springfield all the way. I really don't. And uh, then they offered me a ticket. I was there for a week. I was one of the guys, you know what I'm saying? I, I, and I was, I was getting a taste of something new when they offered me the, uh, the ticket to Men's Encounter. And that's when I went to my first Men's Encounter was in January 2020, and uh, man, the only time I'd ever been around that many men was in prison, and it wasn't, so I went in with a chip on my shoulder, man, I was embarrassed, I only had the clothes I had on, been in the shoes for months, they stunk, I was just, everything the enemy was trying to strike at me to leave, he was hitting me with, and uh, the guys kept praying for me, literally the night before encounter, I ran out of the Mount Move ministry seven times that day, I always wonder why seven times. Seven is the number of perfection. The last time, I'll never forget, Dodie would give me a ride. He said, hurry back, my brother. And uh, I was going to do something that I shouldn't have done. And uh, God called me, got there, and Dodie took off driving down the road. And literally, when I seen his taillights turn around that corner, I was running. For the car? I, I, yeah, I ran all the way down the road. I ran probably a half a mile in logging boots and everything running. I ran all the way there. Ran back. He was opening his house meeting sermon, or they were doing a Thursday night deal. When I literally went through the door, slid to my, was crying, slid down, and the guys all looked at me. I said, I'm not leaving again. I'm here. And they all prayed over me. He said, what happened? I said, I'm not supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be right here. And I went to Men's Encounter the next day and uh, changed my life forever. I still, uh, I didn't get it right. I tried. I was in the house, man. And now I, the things I know now, I wish I'd have known then. Like I, you heard me say it before, man, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in discipleship houses. Mm -hmm. I did. I lived a 47-year life of my life, a, a worldly life. Didn't know how to change that. The discipleship houses give you a, a basis, and they and they help. They disciple you, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples and be disciples. Mm -hmm. So they were pouring into me, but I, I didn't put God first place. I was in love with them, don't get me wrong. I mean, he was doing things in my life, but I kept putting things above him. I kept trying to keep the old and the new, and you, there's no gray area with God. You're either hot or you're cold. If you're lukewarm, he'll spew you right out of his mouth. I was riding the fence. I, tried, I wanted it my way, but his way, but my way. And, and um, I, I let a failed relationship get me away from it, a failed relationship what got me. I put something above my God and I walked out of the ministry house on a pass. I hadn't taken a pass for 90 days. Didn't want one. If, and I was a firm believer. If it didn't go smoothly, it wasn't a God. I forced that pass. When I forced that pass, I went out. I ended up getting drunk and getting high. Called Dodie because Dodie had found me. He said I was on his heart. He literally found me where I was at. He said, what can I do for you, my brother? I couldn't even look at him. I said, I'm okay. I said, I'm on pass. He said, and where Dodie went was tough for him too. There's reasons in his testimony for it. And uh, the love Dodie has for his brothers and to be a servant of God, man, to knock on that door and to do what he did took a lot of strength and a lot of God, a whole lot. And his words for me were, when you need me, you call me. And I'll never forget it. I'm in the middle of this house on a Saturday night and two girls look at me. I said, you're nothing like we heard about. And I looked at him. And I said, what do you mean? They said, man, we've heard so much about Casey Blair here lately. You're nothing that we heard about. And I looked at him. I said, well, I'm doing things I'm not supposed to be doing with people I'm not supposed to be doing them with. I'm a little, I don't know. I'm quiet. And I was going through what conviction, but the enemy was hitting me with so much condemnation. I wouldn't even talk. He didn't want you to be convicted. This girl, Lily, looked at me. And she said, can I pray for you? 
I threw my hat off. And she comes back a couple minutes later. She goes, did that mean yes? I'm like, come on. <laughs> yes, pray for me. So we're doing things that we weren't supposed to. But this girl was obedient to God, and she prayed for me. It gave me a, m enough clarity to grab my cell phone and dial Dodie's number. I'm telling you right now, he had to be waiting around the corner. Because he showed up so fast, I heard the honk. I was like, <laughs> I ran out the door. I said, love y'all, but I got to go. Got in the car, and Dodie looked at me. So that was quick. So I know. I was like, thank you. He said, you okay? I said, no, I'm not, Dodie. He said, I know. He said, it's going to be okay, Casey. I stayed at that ministry over the weekend, knowing what was going to happen, you know, because I had went out and used. Um, that is zero tolerance policy. But when Jonathan McClure got there that Sunday morning for the house meeting, I literally looked at him. He said, you need to talk to me. I said, sit down, Jonathan. We need to talk. For the first time in my life, I ever held myself accountable. Um, I knew it was going to happen. I had God on my side. I thought I could do it. I couldn't. Um, I started labeling myself as the king of fall. I could, but I knew I was abusing God's grace. Um, then I got in a relationship and I put her above God and it went sour. And in 2020, it was one of the best years of my life because man, I, was, I was changing, but it was also the roughest year of my life too because in that year I had gotten mad at God over this failed relationship with this girl and somehow the enemy got in and I walked away from God for a year. I went full tilt back in my old life. And I mean, and when it says it'll bring back seven more vicious and stronger, it will. I become the worst I've ever been to people that had known me my whole life with the company. Everybody was scared to death of me. They didn't know if I was gonna if I was gonna beat them, rob them. They didn't know what was gonna happen. I was man. I would my mood swings. Would, I could be from perfectly happy to next thing you know, the guy next to me might be getting beat up. Um, I was everything. I had welcomed so much back in and literally did it with my own accord. Um, I was so mad at God for no reason, and then the enemy kept telling me I was worthless. I was never, you know, and I believed the lies, and I had tasted the goodness of God but I had walked away from him. But my God who's rich in mercy <laughs> and grace. Um, I was at a creek doing things I shouldn't have been doing with the girl I shouldn't have been doing to that day before. We set up shop on a creek bank later on that night. And I literally, the last three people that wouldn't, that weren't scared of me, Literally, I looked up at that creek bank and I knew what we were getting ready to do. And uh, something just told me to leave. I had my Montero, we were all partying. I wouldn't touch nothing, no, I quit doing it. I wouldn't, they kept offering it. And I was like, no, I don't want that. I literally looked up and I said, I literally told them, and these were the last three people that said they'd never leave me. <laughs> I said, somebody's dying here tonight. And they all looked at me. They said, bro, you okay? I said, no, man, somebody's going to die here tonight. And uh, it scared him to death from who I was and the, I guess the seriousness of my voice. I got my Montero and I drove and I was driving dirt roads. And uh, I threw three phones out that night, three phones I had. On the last phone, I sent a text out that said, phone's gone, goodbye. And uh, I felt the weight on me. I kept driving, and I drove back to that creek bank where they were all at, and uh, I pulled in a cornfield and fell asleep for just a little bit. I don't know for how long, and uh, I was just sitting there thinking. I guess I went to sleep and I woke up. Well, when I, when I drove down right below where the creek was at, everybody was gone. Something snapped at me. I can't explain it, man. I had felt the brokenness and the loneliness I had never felt before in my life. I literally drove around crying trying to at different creeks that night to stop and go to sleep and just think. And it felt like something was following me or watching me. I know now what it was. And uh, I know the words that I spoke, what they were, um, till I drove all night and it was early morning, the sun was starting to come up when my gas light come on and I was at a creek. I call it Redemption Creek now. And uh, I pulled in that creek, looked at my gas light on and knew I, I had probably enough gas to make it to town maybe once, twice. I was done driving. God guided me to a creek to do a work only he could do. Um, when the sun come up, I thought I'd drive to town to get me some cigarettes. 
and a Mountain Dew, and a, I drove to town. I got to the city limits, about almost to the Mountain Moving Ministry House. I turned around and went right back. I wasn't meant to be in town. I knew that. Drove back to my creek, shut my Montero off, wrote a letter, giving everything I own, my Montero and everything, to my blood, brother and another person. Apologized for what I was about to do and said, this is all I have of a meager existence of 48 years of life. Left the note in my Montero, walked to the spring-fed creek where I was at, took my knife out of my pocket and did two runs up my wrist and I knew it would be sharp enough. And uh, right before I went to stab that into my wrist and jerk upwards, I heard a steel voice in my mind and felt something on my heart that I had not felt in so long. And the voice said no. I immediately threw the knife into the creek, started crying. It ran to my, ran to my ride and pulled my Bible out, my blanket and my pillow. After all I said, I was, everything was in my ride. And, uh, out my Bible, and the first words I read when my Bible flopped perfectly open, it just opened to it. I looked down at my Bible, which I had not read, was out of First Peter 1, 22 through 24. It says, We are not born of perishable seed, but imperishable seed, for people are like the grass and the, and the glory of the flowers of the field. For the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. I never memorized that verse. That verse from that day on has been in my brain seared there. I call it my rainbow word now. That's the word God gave me. That word saved my life. People will come and go. They're going to fail us. They're going to die. They're going to pass away. They're going to leave your life. But the one person that will never leave you nor forsake you is our God. His word never fails. It endures through. It's endured from the moment it was spoke into existence. From the moment he spoke the world of existence, his word will endure through everything. It's our everything. I don't know what happened on that creek bank. But I know I went to sleep, and when I woke up, I felt my heart, something had changed. Everything was just peaceful, you've been there. There was a peace about me that I'd never experienced before in my life, even, I don't know if, I know now, I mean, I do know now, that was the moment that I fully went all in for Jesus Christ. Um, as I said, he knew my heart, he knew I was going to kill myself. He had plans for me, not plans not to harm me, but to prosper me to give me hope in the future. What the enemy tried to use for evil, God meant for good. It's my testimony of his greatness, of his glory, that no matter how far we go back, he's still there. We'll get it. Sometimes we're stubborn. Sometimes we're prideful. Sometimes we won't humble ourselves. I had all three of those. I didn't know how to do it. And uh, so as God led Elijah to a brook, I had to think to myself, because I had 30 days on that creek bank to think. It was nothing but me and my God. That was it. A guy from Mountain Moving, when I drove off, had given me a box of food that lasted me three weeks. When I'd come to town, people somehow was hearing my story of how I was living on this creek bank, and I don't even know how it got out. They would walk up and give me $20. And be like, I'm sorry, this is all I could give you. I was like, man, this is a blessing. That's a little bit of gas in my Montero, a pack of cigarettes and a piece of pizza and a Mountain Dew. I'm happy. God will provide. Because God told me in that moment on that creek bank to trust him. I said, I will. He taught me something on that creek bank. He used, he used ravens of 2022 in his own way, of 2021 in his own way. He used people as his ravens. He led me to a place of safety. It was August. It was hot. It was a creek, man. Only spring-fed creek around. I saw five people the whole time I was there. God knew what I needed at that moment. He knew I needed him and nothing but him. I trusted him. I went back to encounter. Man. I thought I'd let my brothers down. I had so many servers run up to me that I was serving beside. You know, and, and it started to, I was I was serving and they were like, brother, what happened? Why didn't you reach out? I looked at them because I didn't know how. I was prideful. I didn't want to talk about my problem. I didn't want to let them know, hey, I'm struggling with addiction again. How do I how do how do you help me? How does this I, I need to fight how do I do this? They wrapped they didn't not want them condemn me, they wrapped me up in prayer prayed for me, man, and that was probably the best encounter, I, I mean, it was so free, I thought the first one was, but man, when you humble yourself before the hand, I would take humility as somebody, I would took it as a fleshly nature. Did it you is, think humbleness 
meant weak. Yes. It meant like you were weak. I thought, no, I thought that it was like humility, like somebody was going to come up in humility, you know. Mm -hmm. I took it as a, the enemy had it as a, but God, as humility is, man, when you humble yourself before God, man, you got to remove yourself out of the way. I learned that on that creek bank. He provided for everything I had. I don't know what happened, like I said, but I, I know this. On that creek bank, I fell in love with my Lord Jesus Christ and my Lord and Savior. He showed me what it is to trust in Him when I do. I prayed. I, I come back from an encounter, and they could not believe it. It was getting around the encounter. The guys come up, man, do you need a place to stay? I'm like, no, I got a creek. They're like, Casey, you're living, living on the creek. I was like, yeah, man. I said, it's great, man. It's spring fed. I said, water comes right out of a rock. I got a little brook, you know what I'm saying? It's about three foot deep. I get a bathe in, man. If it gets too hot, I'm there. I said, man, Dodie's help, man. When Dodie's got work, he lets me work. If not, I stay for the Bible study, and I go back, and I study my word all day. But the greatest thing about it was it was on private property. And I remember this creek from when I was a kid. I used to do cocaine there. That's where I, we used to go and my, it, when my addiction first started. And God guided me to the same place. I used to hide and do my cocaine when I was a teenager. He guided me to that same spot. He took it all the way around. I think I just thought of that now. He's took it all the way back. He guided me there, man, to trust in him with absolutely everything. People would show up looking for me because I'd tell them, if you ever need me, I'm on a creek, man. This is where I'm at. They would see my washcloth and soap sitting on a rock ledge. They were like, dude, you were li really living there. I saw your soap. I'm like, hey, man, best bath ever. I said, about 3 o'clock when it's hitting 100, that water is cool. Well, you make you hurry. A man in the counter <laughs> literally told me, he said, you're supposed to dip yourself seven times. But he had told me that before I had walked out. I didn't know why. He said, something's going to happen to you, Casey, but you need to dip yourself seven times. Literally, when I come back from that counter, I literally dip myself seven times in that freezing cold water. I don't know why. But I literally looked at that man at that at encounter. I said, I did what you told me to do. I'm living on a creek. And he looked at me and he just smiled. I said, I'm supposed to pray for you right now. God opened up something in my heart because I removed, he didn't open it up. I removed everything out of my heart. Um, as I said, Dodie was providing. I wasn't allowed nowhere because I, everybody had doubts. I mean, because in my hometown, I was, I, I couldn't believe it when I first walked the encounter. Ooh, Casey Blair. I was like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here. And uh, now I look at it when people see me and they're like, Casey Blair, I'm like, this is what God does. He come from the worst of the world. He come from the center. And I was the worst in my town at the time. Um, man, and when I went back to my creek, everybody couldn't believe that I was on the creek. I'm like, I, I'm good. And I had a prayer there. I'll never forget it. I was sitting there with God one night, and a thunderstorm was coming through. And it was getting later August, close to September. And I told God, I said, man, I love it here. I said, but it's going to be getting cold. So I'm going to need somewhere to go. I said, so I'm going to need you to tell me where to go, where I'm going to be safe. Um, I had things happening in my old life because I went back to it. Literally, I had a death threat from two separate people. They were real. I got pulled in by comment on them, questioned about them, and I just laughed. And they literally asked me, why are you laughing? These are real. I said, well, one, if he's saying it over prison phone lines, he's, he's stupid, so I know it's real. And the other I knew was real because he said it straight to my face. You know? One of them is a born-again believer now. I've been praying for him for two years. And uh, the other one, in time. But uh, I laughed, and they said, why are you laughing? I said, because, man, when I come back to God, I was doing concrete work at Camp Niangua. A man I never met before in my life walked up to me. He said, do you believe I have a word from God from you? And I was three days into my, new, into my Christian walk again, pushing through it because I had spent a year lost and I was pushing through it, trusting God to get me through it. Dodie was running a power trial about from here 20, 30 feet away. And the guy, I could barely hear him, he said, I said, why would God have a word for me? I said, man, I walked away from him. I went back to my old life for a year. So what would he have to say to me? He said, well, this is what he has to say. He said, man, continue the work he had you start. He will keep you protected. I guess the look on my face said it all because he's like, do you, you must understand, do you understand what that means? I said, <laughs> I said, but say it again one more time. He said, continue the work he had you start. He'll keep you protected. And literally, I looked up and was crying. 
and Doty was running a power trial. And if you've ever been one of the really loud, Doty was looking back at me and he was just ear to ear <laughs> smiles. I knew it was from God. He said, what's that mean? And I looked at him, I said, going back to work, going back to his kingdom, I'm going back to kingdom work. And uh, I'll never forget though, to go back to when I was making that prayer for Ken. He, uh, God put the, put the, I made a prayer, guide me somewhere saying, and the voice, just the still voice said, Ken, I was like, no, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> and I was like, surely somewhere else. I kept praying. And for a period, I kept getting Ken. So I called Ken Palm, and I met him at the Mountain Grove. Uh, two, it was a couple weeks went by. He said, man, he said, Casey, can you meet me at the Mountain Grove, uh, at the Grove restaurant? I said, yeah. I said, but I'm gonna bring somebody. I got my brother Brooks Williams with me. Hmm. Should have been two that day. Brooks still had things to go through. Um, Ken said, what do you need? I said, I need a bed. I said, this is what I do now. This is what I put myself in. I'm running six days a week. I said, my seven days for church, but these are all the meetings I'm going to right now. I said, I need a bed, my Bible, and to be left alone and let God do his work. Ken looked at me and said, you got it. And he said, Brooks, what do you need? Brooks wasn't ready yet. Brooks had to go through some things. and. Uh, I had to call Ken because of the things that were going on in my life. I said, man, I can't come right now, but I want to come. I said, but this is what's going on, Ken, and it's real. You know what I'm saying? I, I can't endanger your family or anybody in the ministry because this is real. I don't know where it's going to come from. And then a few weeks went by, and I called Ken again. I said, hey, man, it was after I went to to the Camp Niangua, and that man said that to me. I said, Ken, man, everything's going to be okay, man. I said, can I come still? He said, absolutely. So when you coming? I'll never forget this. I was talking to a young lady parked above the hill before we get into big boys. And uh, I was literally telling her, I said, I have an option. I can come up there to you. We were literally talking. I knew this girl from my old life. And she said, go do what you're supposed to do. I said, okay. Shut my phone off and literally drove into Ken's. And uh, Ken inducted me into the big boys. It wasn't really a, there was a few people there. But, uh, and... He gave me the room. Um, we started doing things together. Um, I was sold out for Jesus Christ, and I mean that in the best possible way ever. Um, that was two years, a little over two years ago. I've not had the want or taste of drugs ever hit my mouth or even think about it again. He took that. Um, God knew I was ready to give it. I don't know what happened on that creek bank. Um, am I perfect? No. But I, I, my heart fell in love with Jesus Christ as, as my Lord and Savior. I had to go through some things. A man told me when I come back to God, he said, what's fire do to gold, Casey? Him and his wife. I was sitting on the mountain Grove square. I looked at him and said, purifies. He said, God is omnipresent, mm -hmm. omnipowerful, ain't he? I said, absolutely, Tommy. He said, man, you were prideful. I said, yeah, I was. His wife goes, you need to humble. He said, God could have stopped you like that. He could have spoke the word stop. You'd have stopped. He said, but he allowed you to go back because you needed to get purified. He said, I didn't think it would be this long, Casey. He said, I'm glad you're back, brother. He said, you look different. You talk different. I humble myself. I don't get it right. I still go through things. But in the time I was in the ministry, I, uh, I learned. I used to say I didn't have mittens. I don't know how to be gentle with people. Ken told me, he said, you're giving the enemy a foothold in your life. He's hearing every time you say that, Casey. He said, what is God? I said, love. He said, do you have God in you? I said, yeah. He said, then you have his love. It worked. I learned how to use mittens now to talk to people. Um, the anger. What the enemy, when he took the addiction, the enemy tried everything else. He tried women. He tried gambling. I brought it all to my ministries. You know, I brought it to Doty. I brought it to Ken. I had come to him right away with problems. I'm like, man, listen, this is what he, this, what's going on in my life. He's like, man, listen, he's just trying something. And they'd pray over me. We'd get through it. Um, and then... Two months into the being at Big Boys, Ken looked at me. He said, well, you're the new house leader. I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> but it wasn't the fact that I was a leader. It's the fact this is what I want, and this is what I want everybody to get. And we're going to go through things. It's going to be hard at times, man. We And a lot of us spent lifetimes in addictions. And if you're hearing this message, know this, man. Your past does not define you. There is hope, and it's in Jesus. That's the only way you're going to beat it. I don't care what people say. I don't care anything about it. Higher powers. There's one higher power. His name's God Almighty. Right. 
Um, this is coming from a man that claimed heathen for life for 47 years. Never knew how to stop drugs. He took it when I was ready to freely give it, and I mean give it from every ounce of my being. Is there hope? Yeah. Are we going to be perfect? No. The moment we hit perfection is the moment we get through the pearly gates. No man in the world is perfect. He sent the one and only perfect lamb for our sacrifice so we could have this gift of eternal life and salvation. We're going to go through things. we got to go through things to get to the one true thing. It's not going to be easy because the enemy come to kill, steal, and destroy. He prowling around like a roaring lion waiting for you to say something negative out of your mouth or a shift in your movements of what God's having you do because that's what he does. He lies to us. He tells us we're not worthy. When we are, God deems us worthy. There's nothing God will not forgive. I can promise you that. I've been through it all. He's forgiven me for everything. But he asked me one thing in return. As he forgives me, I have to forgive everybody else. So I've went through the ones that I have hurt. And if anybody's watching this that I hurt, have hurt, I ask your forgiveness. I'm not that guy no more, and I'm sorry for what I've done. I've walked up to people that I've hurt. Lately asked them for forgiveness. You'd be surprised what God will do. He'll get you through absolutely everything, but he has to be number one. And I learned that in life the hard way. I've got a lot of tattoos. Don't let your past define you, because God will take the biggest mess and turn them into your biggest message. My Amen. message is that there is hope through Jesus Christ. It comes with salvation. Ezekiel says he will sprinkle clean water on you and wash away your sins. He will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That is honest to God truth. I know because I lived it. Um, I don't know what else to tell you, but my God, I'm sold out for him. Preach, Casey. His mercy, he's given to us freely every day. And when we accept Jesus Christ, no man, everything's not going to be peaches and rainbows. It's not going to be perfect. Things are going to come our way. And it's if we draw nigh to him, that means closer. And we draw, we have to push through it, y'all. Storms will come our way. He is the master storm maker. Know that. So he controls everything. People think, oh, I'm in the middle of a storm. The enemy sent it. Well, remember this, y'all. God created everything and is the source through everything. Romans 12, 1 says to offer your body as a living sacrifice, which is holy and pleasing to God. There's more to it. I want you to look it up. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's more to it. Look it up. There's a reason why I want you to look it up. We've been people of the world for so long. This is our temporal home. We're just passing through. We've got work to do. If you're a born-again believer, you have a great commission. It says to go out to baptize, go out to all nations and baptize in, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're a born-again believer, you have the same power as Jesus Christ did. You have the power to heal. You have the power to cast out devils and demons. I have not seen a dead man resurrected, but I have seen dead men come to life with a new life and a new heart and a new song. And that song is for God Almighty through Jesus Christ. I call Jesus Christ my best defense attorney ever. He sits on the right hand of God mediating for me. When I mess up, I come to him with a heartfelt repentance. Like I said, he's never lost a case, y'all. He's the best defense attorney in any, and he's pleading our case to the Father right now. So I don't know what you're going through. I do not know the things you've been through, but I know what I've been through. I know what the world did to me. I know what the enemy lied to me about. And I know if God can save a wretch like me, he can save anybody out there. Because I know, as Paul says, I was the worst. I was the worst in my area at the time. So if any of y'all are watching this, man, my name's Casey Blair. You can find me on Facebook. I wear an encounter hat. I'm a child of the one true king. And through grace and mercy, I'm his child. That's all I got for you. That was amazing. That was him. That was yeah. me. If the word starts coming out, that's all him. <laughs> I squirrel sometimes. I was trying not to squirrel. <laughs> Listen, Jesus loves you. There's people out there hurting. Um, it's, this world can be evil and hurt is out there. And 
We need Jesus. Jesus I, loves you. You know, the thing about it, I, I used to wonder why, God, I know why God pulled me, because he loves me. And I'm like, why me? Why me? But then I realized, man, when I start running across these dudes that know me from prison or the gang life, like the man that comes, it's not me. I know it's God, but he's using me as a vessel. You know what I'm saying? But everybody asks me, Tom, I'm a trophy of God's grace. But when people see me of that old life that knew me and, and they walk, you know, like the prisoners, you know, that I did life with in there and they see something different. Like, ah, what happened? I mean, I just want to pray for you. That's all I want to do. All the rest of God's work, but I just want to, I just want to put his prayer out on you. You know what I'm saying? And then I realized why he pulled me, because man, the Southwest is devastating. I've, I've literally looked at him and said, I'm so sorry. I've told him, I'm so sorry we led you the wrong way, but this ain't the way. This is not the way. It started out in a whole different aspect. You know what I'm saying? And, and when I look at the bylaws, breathe a little bit. Oh, well, we got that wrong, didn't we? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we confuse the whole of how we put it down, of how it got twisted. Because it was, I am my brother's keeper. Yep. I am my brother, and that was the main purpose of it. I am my brother's keeper. Well, I am my brother's keeper, and if I can be God's vessel to do anything, I will. Isaiah, I, I've been very careful to say this here lately, because I have one brother to give testimony. He said it, and he's doing a seven-year bit, because that's where God put him. I don't believe God put him in prison. I believe he misunderstood that. I believe he was supposed to take the 120, but he was prideful and didn't take it. That's just my honest opinion. So I'm very careful because he's like, I told God here, I am send me and he sent me here. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. So I'm very careful when I'm specific. I'm like, God, here, send me, but please don't send me to the prison. <laughs> unless, <laughs> but That's Ken, the truth. Ken's trying to get me an OCC right now since I can get in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, send me in, but yeah. let me ride out. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't want to go back. Right. But, Listen, no matter how big or how little you think your story is, your story counts and... Uh, your story is something that somebody out there will benefit from. Um, this is o Unpacked with Overcomer Ministries. Um, in August, I'm going to be sitting down with Lee Lyles. Amen. Mm -hmm. Come on. Past and Pastor Lee Lyles. Pastor Lee Lyles. And in September, I will be sitting down with Jonathan McClure. Amen. And in October, um, Pastor Ken Palm reached out to me and said that he would like to Amen. do an episode. So. All, all trophies is, of God's grace from an old life to a new life. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Amen. Um, I'm just tickled to death that God is using this ministry all out of one word that came to my head a few years ago when I was explaining my husband, telling my parents to my husband, I said, he's an overcomer. And that's how it all started. So you can be an overcomer too. Thanks for, for uh, watching. We love you guys. Bye-bye.